Hello. In case this is your first visit to Research America's 2020 Health Research Forum, welcome. I'm Mary Woolley, the President and CEO of Research America. A highlight of this three-day event is a series of conversations between extraordinary leaders in the R&D arena that we've entitled Science on the Front Lines of COVID-19. I'm particularly honored to introduce the participants in the next conversation in this series. Dr. Francis Collins, the Director of the National Institutes of Health, and Dr. Michael Dalston, the Chief Scientific Officer and President of Worldwide Research Development and Medical at Pfizer. Dr. Dalston is also a board member of Research America. And now I want to introduce our moderator, Susan Sir who among her many distinctions currently serves as Senior Policy Fellow at the Robert J. Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University. And Susan, I'm pleased to add, is also a Research America board member. Thank you all and over to you, Susan. Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you for your leadership at this really important time. And Francis and Michael, welcome. It's great to see you both again. As you know, our topic today is how public-private partnerships and cross-sector collaboration really are playing a central role in responding to COVID-19. Uh, it was actually an aviation writer, Benet Wilson, who once said that extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures. And in these truly extraordinary times, we have seen, as you all know, a phenomenal variety of private partnerships and public-private partnerships formed to tackle an array of issues, whether it was uh, testing, COVID testing, development of therapeutics, vaccines, supply chain issues, you name it, there have been partnerships, extraordinary partnerships formed all over this arena. Uh, as we know, some in particular are the NIH-led Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic Interventions and Vaccines, or ACTIVE, public-private partnership, and of course, Operation Warp Speed, uh, led by HHS. So Francis, I wanna start with you and your experience. Is there any precedent for the formation of these large cross-sector partnerships, such as we've seen during the pandemic? Well, yes, uh, Susan, great to see you and, and thanks for moderating our discussion here. And it's great to do this uh, with Michael Dolston, my uh, friend and colleague over many years in these kinds of partnerships. So yeah, there is a track record here. I've now been an IH director for a little over 11 years. And I would say one of the most exciting things that's been possible during that time is figuring out ways to put together these kinds of public-private partnerships that bring the scientists uh, with the vision from both sectors around the same table try to figure out, are there things we can do together that would be pre-competitive, where the data could be immediately accessible to everybody? We can share resources, both financial and in terms of scientific expertise, and just move the ball forward faster than otherwise might happen. This kind of got started initially in something called the Accelerating Medicines Partnership, uh, which is something that Michael and I worked together, and it took Frankly, it took about two years to convince all the partners that this would be something we'd want to do uh, for common illnesses where everybody was looking for new ideas about therapeutics. And that emerged as AMP focused on Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. And subsequently has added other projects on Parkinson's disease. And uh, pretty soon, uh, one on schizophrenia, and we're talking about one on gene therapy. And it has been a wonderful experience. I think everybody looking at this would say this has been a model that has been incredibly productive and has really encouraged scientists across sectors to get to know each other and to figure out how to collaborate in new ways. And it has produced an awful lot of really useful data that's advanced the field. So when COVID-19 came along, I think, Michael, you might have been the first person I called about, should we have one of these uh, for COVID-19? And we started talking about that back in March when things were looking like, oh, this might be pretty serious. You know, it maybe took two years to start uh, the first AMP project uh, back six or seven years ago. And for COVID-19, I think we did it in two weeks, <laughs> basically, assembling the people from both sectors who felt there was something we could do together here. And in the space of uh, that timetable, starting on April 15th, I launched what has been an incredible partnership called ACTIVE, as you've just mentioned, 
accelerating COVID-19 therapeutic interventions and vaccines. Pulling into that, uh, more than 100 people who've pretty much been 24 seven devoted to this and a series of working groups to focus on therapeutics, on vaccines and clinical trials and preclinical efforts. It has been amazing uh, what this group has done and boy, my hat is off to all of them. Michael has been a big part of that as part of the executive committee, which I co-chair with Paul Stoffels. And the enthusiastic participation uh, in, in the industry has just been uh, remarkable to see. And nobody's really thinking too much about who's going to get the credit. We just got to get this done because the world is waiting and people are at risk and we have to hurry the process up. So it sounds as if what at least helped a lot is that you all knew each other and there was precedent for these kinds of partnerships. Michael, is, what's your perspective on that? Is that an effect uh, what contributed to the speed with which you were able to mount these efforts? Yeah, Susan, I, I think um, uh, track record in what has been accomplished here using AMP as uh, a science foundation matters a lot. And I, I think everyone feels proud and believe we can do it again. You want to be part of a winning team. And I think AMP has turned over the last almost seven years now into generating basic and translation of science that matters so much for colleagues that are either hands-on or nowadays it's more brains-on as a lot of it is it data mining. And, uh, you know, the best test you can do is walk into a lab environment. Now, now of course, we are a kind of virtual walking and ask um, uh, how much AMP has meant, whether it's for Alzheimer, inflammation diseases and, and um, diabetes. And I've always got a very um, uh, strong, it's really changed the way we can bring uh, insights together. So when uh, Francis called in March, and by the way, I should say, uh, it, it's all about individuals too. And, and when Francis calls, he on one hand brings uh, such a scientific crisp question to the table, but uh, his enthusiasm and his uh, tireless way of making so many different personalities come together <laughs> and uh, be able to play a tune that sounds really great makes all of us feel we have to do it. And that was the emotional and thought that immediately came to my mind in, in March. Um, Active had a little bit of a special challenge because um, we didn't have time to create the scientific and insights in translation of science as a roadmap. We really had to get into a field trip together immediately. And I think we uh, have come pretty far on maybe the three legs that we'll hear more about monoclonal antibodies as one therapeutic arm, and now also antivirals as another arm of legacy in um, this type of diseases. And finally, on the vaccines, I think there's been some great discussions. And I just wanted to punctuate that what was great with the active is that it fostered dialogues, common learning, and not just among the partners that are involved full time, but um, FDA was participating uh, regularly and uh, giving us a better uniform understanding on what they are expecting. And then with NIH, we were able, I think, to uh, really pin down what is best practice and how do we all try to strive to have that high quality of rigorous science, where do we do antibodies, antivirals, or vaccines. And we were proud to participate in many of these work streams and to have uh, one of my colleagues, Catherine Janssen, to co-share the vaccine. So what do you think the hallmarks of success for these partnerships should be beyond the obvious? You obviously want uh, effective diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines. Are there other secondary hallmarks that you think these partnerships should be judged by? So, um, yeah, I could comment a bit, and uh, Michael, your comments were incredibly generous about how this has all come about. It really only works because of the dedication of many significant leaders, and you have been such a profoundly important voice in that. I got to say, pharmaceutical company leadership tends to turn over sometimes a little too fast, and 
your uh, being in that position as a leader advisor over these years has been incredible because of the stability and the experience that you brought uh, to all of these partnerships. And I've been very much benefited by the chance to learn from you and work with you in that regard. You know, in terms of what ACTIVE has been able to do, um, and there were these four working groups that were put together. One of the things that's gonna be a lasting legacy is that we actually figured out how to assemble a full inventory of clinical trial capacity that could be brought to bear in a, in a public health emergency of this sort. There's clinical trial networks all over the place. Many of them are run by NIH, but they're run by other enterprises as well. And of course, the private sector runs such networks, oftentimes through CROs. Nobody had ever really tried to figure out what's there, and particularly what is shovel-ready that could start a trial in six weeks or less if there was an important therapeutic that needed to be tested. We did that through one of these working groups and created now a really remarkable asset uh, that people can look at to figure out where the capacity is. And even we can map across that where the disease is, because what you want to know for COVID-19 is if you've got a great idea about a therapeutic, how do you actually get it tested in the place where the disease is spreading actively? And how can you set it up really fast? That was pretty amazing. And that whole experience has now moved into NIH and NCATS as something that will be curated and sustained over time. So we'll have it going forward. I would say another thing that ACTIVE was able to do through these working groups was to set up these master protocols to enable testing uh, of therapeutics, a master protocol, for instance, for monoclonal antibodies, so that you would have the opportunity when new possible uh, specific molecules came along to quickly put them into one of these trials that everybody had already agreed in terms of the endpoints and what you're going to measure along the way as far as your laboratory tests. And you don't go through what otherwise could be months and months of wrangling about those details that's kind of done. And then you harmonize the effort, which also gives you a better chance to compare different therapeutics and different vaccines. Uh, that has also not really been done that often. And I think the experience from everybody's view was so positive that it's something we will probably want to do more of in the future. Those are just a couple of things. I could go on a long time about things that ACTIVE did that are unprecedented and that I think have really accelerated the field. So that now we have really well-designed, high-powered clinical trials for vaccines and therapeutics going on all over the place with the expectation that answers will come a lot sooner as a result. So you both uh, referenced the involvement of FDA in this partnership, signaling what its expectations are from a regulatory standpoint. And we uh, understand now that there is some sense that a vaccine could be approved or vaccines could be approved even before the culmination of phase three trials. Let's talk about that for a moment. What, what does that mean for science uh, to have that speed of, of regulatory approval after the scientific process has uh, begun to play out? Michael, let me start with you on that. Yeah, I, I think in these times where uh, society under a fear of a pandemic um, has science as one of the reliable foundation to guide you into the future. It's critical that science communicates with a uniform voice and that it's um, relying on rigor and quality. And I, I think the spirit of the professional broad society of scientists that active has been that speed cannot um, overcome quality. You need to have a data set that um, can stand productive challenge from a broad scientific community and where it's clear that the benefit to risk is very favorable. Of course, it is the mission of FDA to review benefit to risk, but the scientific foundation for that means that we need to stick to best practices. And I think active crystallized an unprecedented coming together feeling that what you need in this case is a large phase three trial. I, I think numbers were measured, um, mentioned at active as 30,000 or more participants pending how data is emerging. And it needs to be you know, monitored by an independent data monitoring committee to the most rigorous standards. I think it would be detrimental to try to shortcut that. It can lead to 
disappointment in that you can trust science and to serious medical setbacks as well. So I, I hope that Active and um, FDA can continue this foundation of science that in the end is the only way to have consistent steps forward. And I want to also really punctuate the appreciation we have had for Francis and Tony Fauci who have at numerous times uh, with a very clear voice said that only long lasting and valuable progress with therapeutic and vaccines needs to rely on science that stands up to peer review uh, from colleagues and that is, is really solid. So I think otherwise you also will feed into these sentiments of anti-science or even the anti-vaccination sentiments. We already know that there is a high number of um, American residents and citizens that are concerned about science because they may not fully understand all the details. And I think it's important to um, come together and communicate how rigorous we are and how this is generated on a chain of evidence that stick together. That's the only way to overcome anti-vaccination impact. And if you don't do it properly, you actually may set back society for a long time. And I, I hope we can continue to have this uh, very strong, rigorous science and speed. It's not one, but it's the two together. And ACTIVE has been a real uh, ca catalyst for this. How long do you both believe, uh, whether it's active, whether it's Operation Warp Speed, how long do you think these partnerships are going to persist? Uh, will, will they up and declare victory if we get a few effective vaccines on the market? What will happen to uh, the involvement of companies whose vaccines are not immediately successful? Uh, how, do, how do you think this will play out, Francis? I don't think we entirely could answer that with Christmas at the moment because things are moving so quickly. Let me just say a word, though, about Operation Warp Speed because I think people may be a little confused about what that is and how does that relate to ACTIVE, which we've mostly been talking about. Uh, think of ACTIVE as this public-private partnership, 20 different pharmaceutical companies, multiple NIH institutes, FDA, CDC, the Veterans Administration, the Department of Defense, all of this very ably managed uh, by a critical partner, which is the foundation for NIH, who have done the uh, real spade work of pulling this together and whose uh, program manager staff are really quite uh, remarkable in, in terms of how they've been able to shape and move this forward. Operation Warp Speed is an entirely governmental effort uh, put in place to try to be sure that all of this effort for therapeutics and vaccines was coordinated so that you would not only make sure you ran good clinical trials on the most appropriate uh, options, but you also were prepared for success. And that meant that you would think about manufacturing well in advance of whether you know whether a vaccine or a therapeutic is actually going to work. If you don't do that, if you don't think about things like supply chain, then you could end up in a circumstance where you have a terrific result of a research study and then a very long delay before people who are at risk could benefit from those. So Warp Speed has a big focus, not just on getting the trials run, but also on doing the manufacturing. Uh, we're certainly very engaged in all of that. Warp Speed has, because of that impetus, tried to figure out which are the most promising vaccines and therapeutics that the government would be willing to make investments, in some instances, a billion dollars or more, to be sure that all of those things are being tackled and you don't have a long wait uh, for some success to actually be available to people who need it. And that's a big complicated effort and uh, of course funded by the taxpayers, but it's a very wise investment because of the importance of having a quick result I think the term warp speed maybe has added somewhat to people's anxiety that that means that we're cutting corners with the rigor of the science. And just like Michael has said a minute ago, we will not do that. We cannot do that. We must absolutely stick to the highest standards of safety and efficacy. But what we can do as far as cutting corners is to eliminate those long dead times between when you have something that's ready to go to the next step and when you just do that. And that's, that's what Warp Speed has enabled us to do. Um, and I think that's been a pretty good partnership. You can sort of think of Active as being kind of a design organization, designing all the things that need to happen. 
working with companies to actually make sure these trials get going and with NIH and all of its networks. But with Warp Speed, sort of thinking about how to invest uh, in what might come downstream uh, and you don't want to get caught by surprise so that you're ready uh, to actually implement and deploy success when it happens. So putting that all together, your question, how long will this go on? Warp Speed is certainly committed through the end of calendar year 2020 to push all of this agenda forward. We don't know what's going to happen. Will we have by December a safe and effective vaccine? I certainly hope so. I hope we'll have more than one. But anybody who's done vaccine research will tell you that there's lots of surprises. And just because things have been going pretty well so far, and they have been, doesn't mean we won't encounter uh, some serious bumps in the road. Similarly with therapeutics, I think we're going to find out over the course of the next few months uh, some pretty interesting things, particularly about monoclonal antibodies where the trials are underway, and also about some of the immunomodulators and anticoagulants and, and antivirals. Uh, and, and that will also be something we want to watch closely. Finally, I just say, in terms of what happens to, say, vaccines that have not found their way into the sort of top list of a half dozen or so that are being invested in heavily, we still want to see that go forward. Um, it generally is the case that when you have a disease for which vaccines are being developed, that the first ones that get approval may not be ideal in terms of how they are uh, effective. Can you improve uh, the efficacy with the next generation? In terms of just practical matters, like is it one dose or two? Most of the current vaccines are gonna be two doses. You would love to have one that's one dose, and if downstream that's possible to do, well, people will be interested in that. So we don't wanna see vaccine research for COVID-19 grind to a halt just because we have this half dozen or so that are getting pushed uh, into the phase three trials right now. Susan, just a couple of quick comments there. I, I really like this idea of, of uh, you know, describing active as a design phase and warp speed is the delivery phase. And I think both of them play instrumental roles. We have been proud to participate and have productive dialogues with both, which has facilitated our journey. Clearly, as Francis says, uh, the fall, we look forward to a number of data from monoclonal antibodies, antivirals, and vaccines. And fingers crossed, several will succeed uh, sooner rather than later to bring um, solutions that can not just advance the medical progress, but also a societal progress from this pandemic uh, containment that we have. Just two brief thoughts to build on this. I would love to see that we don't just um, at one time point declare victory and everyone withdraws. I think we have learned that building a pandemic uh, preparedness is something that have, has eroded uh, over time. Mm -hmm. And of course it is vulnerable the longer time until you had a previous pandemic, the more you tend to forget that it may come back. So I, I hope we'll create, maybe it's more an amp-like pandemic science group that will put in place uh, the monitoring tools of how coronaviruses and other similar related viruses that could have pandemic potential, how they are evolving among humans across the globe. And I think we have learned that we may even want to monitor how they're evolving in various um, animal hosts to be a step ahead before something of this magnitude ever could break out. The final aspect I would like to mention also is that there are more pandemics almost, and not all of them are communicable diseases that are communicated that are spread by infectious organisms. Some of them are also the result of um, other factors. We speak about the obesity and diabetes pandemic, and there is a lot of great learnings from um, active that we may be able to implement, how we work more forcefully, more streamlined, and how we can work cross companies, academia, with NH guidance, and bring in the experience of regulators to also address those with a completely different um, mentality and ambition than we have been able to do in the past because of all the disconnects that exist in the ecosystem. Well, let's stay on that point as we uh, move here toward closing, uh, because as you know, Michael, we have 
all kinds of pandemics that are moving maybe a little bit more slowly than the COVID-19 has moved, but whether it's Alzheimer's and dementias, uh, et cetera, we have to be ready to advance science as quickly as possible in all of these arenas. So to both of you, what do you think are the most important lessons from COVID-19 that we can apply, just as you said, Michael, a moment ago, to speed up science in these other very important domains? Michael, let me start with you and then we'll close with Francis. Yeah, I, I think uh, it all starts with uh, a call to action that we all need to come together and recognize um, the, what, what inaction means. And whether you speak about the aging population and the impact of dementia or the external environment changes we have seen, digitalization and ha dietary habits and genetics that cause the metabolic pandemic. I think if we would be able to take the learnings from both active and AMP, we could make over the next five years more progress than we would do maybe in 10 to 15 years if we just continued as is. And it also means to recognize however good you think your group is, you're just a tiny piece of um, the wealth of knowledge and capabilities and if you work together, you can accomplish so much more. And so that there is the insight of the mind and insight of the heart of uh, the beauty and inspiration of working together. But I think you really need to create that kind of call to action and realize how much you could accelerate progress. And certainly groups like Research America has been among those that try to stimulate uh, putting a big challenge on the agenda, but I, I think if we now can take pride in what AMP has accomplished, and I'm very optimistic in what ACTI will accomplish, we also feel the strengths of the past, and hopefully that will lead us to break some new barriers also in these remaining pandemics. Francis, last word to you on this really important question. Michael has uh, very wonderfully expressed the potential here, and I certainly associate myself with the kind of comments and vision that he has put forward. It's traditional, I think, now to talk about the ecosystem for medical research that involves public and private sector, philanthropy, uh, government, uh, and stakeholders of all sorts, especially patients and patient advocates. But I'm not sure that we have always taken full advantage of the ways in which that ecosystem can be linked together in order to make progress happen at twice or three times the normal pace. I think the way this has happened for COVID-19 is in fact truly encouraging that there are possibilities here that we had not fully mined. AMP had done a fair amount of that already. And I think the progress that AMP made in the last seven years has also been a, a wonderful shining light of what the possibilities are. But I think from ACTIVE we've learned it's even possible to be more rapid moving and more expansive and more visionary. And I hope we will carry that sense uh, with us going forward when finally COVID-19 slips into the rearview mirror, which we're, we're not there, folks, but we will get there. And, but there will be other challenges. There are all challenges around us right now as, as have just been enunciated by Michael in terms of things like diabetes, obesity, Alzheimer's disease. And we could, based on this experience, uh, figure out ways to be even more effective in tackling those because the world is waiting. We've got a lot of smart science, a lot of great technology. This is kind of a signal moment, I think, for medical research uh, to jump into a higher gear. And maybe one of the silver linings of this otherwise difficult and dark 2020 covered over by COVID-19 is what we can learn from this that will make us even more effective in the future. Well, I want to thank both of you, first of all, for capturing some of those important lessons already learned in this pandemic and for demonstrating so forcefully that we can speed up without sacrificing the science and that that should be uh, the primary objective uh, and the takeaway that we apply now to so many other uh, issues that we face in biomedical scientific research. So thanks to both of you. And let me turn things now back over to Mary. Thank you all so much, um, not only for spending these moments with us and 
all of those who are listening in, but for your leadership. You know, when, when we defeat COVID-19, it will be because of leaders like you and your colleagues and the institutions and companies that you head. You know, they're a real part of the genius of science. And the genius of science that now we're going to put to work, I, I so resonate with all the things we've been learning and are going to apply going forward so that we can move more quickly toward health for ourselves, our families, our nation, and the world. And you've, you've, you will continue, I know, to be part of that progress. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Susan, for your expert moderating. And everyone, Stay tuned. There's lots more to listen in on in this program. Bye for now.